can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Tom Shipley. You can check him out at tshipley.com and avaacquisitions.com. Before uh, before I formally introduce you, uh, Tom, I like to mention a couple of past episodes people check out. And since you were in the Israeli Defense Forces, I actually did uh, an Israel uh, entrepreneur series. And I had... um, Uh, Eli Wertman, who took three companies from inception to IPO. He's a partner at Pico Venture Partners. Uh, Yuri Adoni is the author of An Unstoppable Startup. And he spent Mm. 20 years in high tech, over a decade being a partner at Jerusalem Venture Partners. And Moise Navone of Mobileye, uh, and they were acquired by Intel for over $15.3 billion. And what I loved about that story, Tom, is he had to at one point, sacrifice and go back to his wife and kids and say, I'm pulling you out of all extracurricular activities. There's no more eating out because the company wasn't doing well, right? So even looking, I like seeing from the outside, it looks like a just a huge success, but there's ups and downs. So I loved how he told that story. And I said, Josh Elzeche, founder of Snow, and I know you're an advisor there. And he talks about how he built up Snow Teeth Whitening. So people should check out that episode as well. And uh, this episode is brought to you by Rise25. At Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships and partnerships. And how do we do that? We help you run your podcast. You know, for me, Tom, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I've found no better way over the past decade than to profile the people and companies I most admire on this planet and let everyone else know what they're working on. So, if you've thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, go to rise25.com to learn more. And there's so much to unpack in today's interview. We have Tom Shipley, he's a serial entrepreneur. Over the past 20 years, he's become one of the leading experts in omnichannel brand building. And Tom's brands have sold over $2 billion through direct-to-consumer marketing and retail. And his brands are widely recognized. You can find them in Costco, Ulta, CVS, Nordstrom's, and many more. And him and his partner successfully exited Atlantic Coast Brands to private equity in 2021. He co-founded Foundry, uh, which is an e-commerce and Amazon brand aggregator, which raised $100 million to create a leading digital first consumer brands company. And uh, he also is co-founder and CEO of Ava, which is AG Ventures aggregator. And they're leading the charge to acquire and scale 30 advertising agencies per year. Right. And, you know, but when you're listening to this, it may be more than that, but that's right now in this point in time. And Tom, thanks for joining me. Well, it's great to meet you and great to connect and happy to be here. I want to start off with the um, Israeli Defense Forces. You had this idea, being a U.S. citizen, that you were going to join the Israeli Defense Forces. I'd love for you to share a pivotal story. Um, love to do that. Um, you know, and we can talk later about my five-year rule and it's the chapter in your life rule. So the question is, is, um, what is that next epic chapter in your life? And just because you've always done something doesn't define you. So, and while that is more meaningful now in my life back then, it was very impactful just thinking things differently. There are the traditional roles and expectations we have and the roles we think we have to follow. And wow, if you want to live your life by other people's rules, it's challenging when you when you look back on your life and say, how, how did everything go? And is it everything I could have do that I really want to do? Is this the life that I really wanted to live? So at the age of uh, 20, I was at Florida State University, a kid growing up in Cleveland, Ohio, Orlando, Florida. Life was um, good. I was in fraternity and and and. Well, I was involved with different causes and Jewish um, uh, causes on campus. The question that came in is, is, am I having impact? Ooh, that one threw me off. And the answer was no. No matter what I was doing, the magnitude of the best case scenario, what I can do was not enough impact. So I decided to uh, 
surprised my parents, went home on a Saturday and asked my, you know, told my dad, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I'm going to let you know that at the end of the semester, I'm leaving Florida State University, moving to Israel and joining the Israeli army. And he went, wait a second, you barely know the language. You don't know much about the country. You know nothing about the army. And so you you run a little bit. So who cares? So what are you going to push papers if they let you in? And so then I said, I understand. And that's what I did at the end of the semester, moved to Israel and I found out about the top three special forces units in the army, identified one that I wanted to go for. And the rule of 10,000 sunk in right then is that it's not, it's similar to whatever you want to pursue in life. And the bigger, the, uh, the goal you have, you're facing what most people would say of unsurmountable odds against you succeeding. And even us living the life we live, whoever we are, we've already beetled so much odds. So in that situation, it was 10,000 soldiers applied to get in my unit. They pick a thousand of us after a battery of tests, physical and psychological and psychotechnical tests. They pick a thousand of us to go to Hell Week. Out of Hell Week, they pick 25 of us to go through a 13 month program. After the 13 months, there were 13 of us left that were that served in the unit. Um, the person that stepped off that plane in Israel had very little chance of succeeding getting to my unit. So, Jeremy, you know, one of the you know things is what did you learn is I had to assume the identity of the person that would succeed that process. I had to actually shift who I was, which became who I was in the future. And basically compress time of who I was going to be and bring it to now. And so as I went there and I, it was like that week of that hell week was like an out of body experience where I was looking at myself on it at this person that I didn't realize that had no fear, that had this un unbelievable level of confidence that pushed myself to another level that nothing could stop me. And I felt unbreakable that week. And I said that if my legs break, literally broken bones is the only way it's going to stop me, but nothing was going to stop because you can always take another step and always another step. And no matter how much people tell you that you're done, you keep on going. And I learned about human character that week. And again, then clearly the years that followed, but uh, human character, what makes unbreakable people, what makes strong people, what makes trustworthy, the power of a team get together, what they can do when there's high level of trust. Um, and that you just never give up and always have a smile on your face, <laughs> no matter how bad things are. And occasionally things are really bad laugh. But if you just take those basic tenets and apply it to whatever, it takes a long way. So um, most of your listeners are entrepreneurs, have led organizations. If you've been around for a nanosecond, you've hit hard times. You thought that the wind was in your back and suddenly you hit a massive wall because um it's never as good as you think it is, is what I tell entrepreneurs. And it's never as bad as you think it is. But, you know, so be careful. And we've all hit those things were great. And suddenly you hit that concrete wall. And then what? It takes a certain amount of resilience and fortitude and passion. And knowing that even though everyone says you're done and closed on the company, you might as well just go home. There's no hope. Um, shit, we entrepreneurs are resourceful is we might not have that. We never have resources in the army. You never have the resource to succeed, but you're taught to be resourceful as entrepreneurs. It's our nature to be gritty and to be resourceful. And when everyone says you're done, it's impossible. We say, let's get to work. So, you know, that's some of the things that I learned and there's some um, amazing stories, amazing people, but I don't think we have the time um, to cover that. Um, but those are just some of the, um, Initial thoughts about what were those initial breakthrough moments of purely an identity shift? I have a question on this, and I don't know if you're allowed to say the answer, but I'll ask anyways, which is, what was the toughest part of Hell Week? Okay, this is a strange one, okay? So as a kid, I was a hard, I wasn't, you know, anything with eye-hand coordination, balls, it wasn't my thing, and I wasn't really that good at it. That's why I chose to do running. And um, it goes back to the trauma of being, I think, a 10-year-old kid in a football league. And therefore, I was maybe small, a little smaller than the average. And then you had people there, kids there that were twice or three times the size. And the pain I felt being knocked on my ass enough times, it didn't endear me to uh, that type of sport. And I remember that during the 
fifth day, we hadn't slept for days and they decided to put us into what they said, an all rules American football game. But it basically was just get the ball, no matter what, to the other side. And it's like one of my nightmares as a kid. Okay. But the person, and therefore that was that second there, but then that shift of who I was at that moment. And that's where, when I said that I became this different person is I never saw that level of athlete inside of me that had that strength and that power and that perseverance to do whatever it took to win in that game. And that's just, and if I say, and so yes, were there interesting things from what we do or tested underwater in the field in stretcher runs with, you know, with a lot of weight on our backs and rotating work. But I look back at those moments with a smile on my face and I don't view those as tough now. And I'm going to say that I was in such a mental state in the zone that nothing can touch me. Hmm. What separated those 13 people that made it? I think there was a little level of strength that they just didn't give up and had the tenacity to always keep on going. And with each one of them, they had this level of inside calm that didn't panic. You know, some people are just hyping everything. And and again, all the guys there, um, they were funny. They were great. The high personality with most of them. But they were all really level and level headed that they just barreled right through anything without getting plugged in. And I'm going to say that um, there is one exercise that they did. They gave us that was in the we hadn't slept for four days and they uh, let let us think they were going to let us go down in the tents. And we went down the tents and half hour later, the firecrackers went off. They pulled us off and. They had us line up in a long line and we we're just barely standing up falling asleep. And they said, okay, when you get to the front, we want you to run out into the desert between the, um, uh, between the different cactus and floor, floor, uh, floor that's out there. We want you to go down after a hundred yards, you're going to see a nightstick for us, a nightstick. We want you to get down and do a hundred pushups and run back and we're going to time you. So as I went up there, I went sprinted, did my hundred. I went, Got up and I went to turn around and said, was that 99 or 100? I went down, did one more. I wasn't sure. So then I ran back. The next morning, we uh, the next morning they called 13 people out. And they called 13 people out. They, and then they looked and they said, you're out. And they looked like this. They said, we had someone out there with night goggles looking at you and you never did the, you didn't do the push-ups. If we cannot trust you when we're not watching, how can we trust you in the field when lives depend on it? So that's why, you know, when it comes to trust, it's one of the most important things in any environment and where you can do extraordinary things if you can trust the people around you and behind you, not only from a uh, integrity, also from a capability and capacity. And everyone there, I'm going to say, was smart and were really good learners. What's another lesson, Tom, you bring into? Obviously, that is a big lesson of trust that you bring into your companies. What's another lesson that you bring in from the special forces into how you run your companies? There has to be a why. And if what you do is driven by make me more money or purely financial driven, if it's driven by you get some really wonky behavior, that's what happens. Um, If it's driven by only here's what we do and how we do it and not the core reason why, Because ultimately, as people, as individuals, we want to believe in something. We want to make sure that the years we have on Earth, even if it's one year with the company, is uh, dedicated. So the why that brought us together in the unit, the why that I look whenever, Tom, I'm starting a company and being involved in anything has to be big enough to be able to warrant the time I'm spending away from my family. And the reason why I'm asking people to sacrifice for that for the cause that we're doing. So that why was, um, was another um, um, big lesson there. I know you have certain criteria of what you, how you think about focusing in on a business. What are some of the criteria that you, you have for what you focus on? It's a great question. Yeah. And it's interesting. A lot of times in life is we look at opportunities because of, what is natural and logical and just right in front of us. And it's interesting when you have a point in life that you have, that you basically, you could, if you chose, have a clean slate and start again. And um, therefore my criteria has changed over time. And I'm gonna say that when I, um, 
left Foundry Brands and we hired a CEO and I left Foundry Brands. And for the first time I actually took off, I said I was going to take off 90 days. I was 30 days successful in that, but really, <laughs> right. without a clear path of creating the next business before I started my current one. And um, I had an executive coach who said to me, Tom, I know you're taking two weeks off and going to Italy. What I want you to encourage you to do is I want you to lay down in a big field, look up, look down, right and left and understand how vast the horizon is. Tom, just because you define yourself in a certain way and that's who you are doesn't mean it's what you should be doing. So think of this way is I'm a great product entrepreneur. All my businesses over the years have been related to products and not services because I love the merchandising piece. I love the development process. I love how we can package and we can market that, whether it's to B2B or B2C and consumers. And it's just what I spent so many, you know, two decades doing. But that shift was, is, okay, let me look at what I really enjoy doing and not what, and therefore, let me look beyond the opportunities that are right in front of me for what I want to do next. And so that's where I started redefining my criteria about what it is. And I said, okay, what is it? Let me start with this is, um, it has to have an impact. I have too many short years on this earth, even if I'm working for 60 of it. And shit, life's too short for you not to be passionate about what you do. And so first of all, one of the shifts I, which is, Kind of related to that is I only want to be surrounded with people that are generative that give me energy. It's a very simple criteria. Is, do you give me energy or not? If you don't give me energy for whatever reason, it doesn't make you bad. It means that I'm going to make room in my life for people to give me energy because the more people that give me energy, the more I can give and the bigger impact and I, have, I can have in the world. Ultimately, when it's all said and done and whenever that last day on earth and I look back at my life, it is... You're not going to be measured with how successful my business were or how I was or how many dollars I have in the bank. It's how much impact did I have on the world, how many people's lives I impact and the impact I had on my family. So therefore, I want to measure what businesses I get into and when I get involved with. What is the level of impact? Am I creating something that is transformational that can have a, a bigger impact on people's lives? I always look for purple ocean opportunities. And defining purple ocean opportunities is we know what um, many people have read blue ocean strategies. We talk about um, the red ocean where it's bloody. It is commodities. It is basically it's all about uh, lower price or getting more volume for what you get and really give Mickey offers to get people to buy again because it's so competitive. Blue ocean opportunities are those where there's no one out there and you're creating something that's truly unique and you're educating people on how to use it. You can in certain ways call Uber a blue ocean opportunity when uh, creating that model. But a purple ocean opportunity is one where you see the marketplace and there's a strong market in that red ocean, but they're unsatisfied and they don't have a vehicle to in which they can uh, be attracted to. That's meaning the goal. So we're going to create a new vehicle and a new approach that meets their what they're doing. And it's a new business niche and the way we do it different from anyone else. And therefore, there is no competition. We did that with Karenique a little over a decade ago. We identified that a woman's or that a hair growth was a great category, strong demand. All the attention, all the dollars are going for men's hair growth, regrowth. Well, most women, one of every three women is suffering from hair loss. The older they get, the higher probability they're going to have hair loss. The older they get, the more discretionary income. And they don't want to buy a men's brand that has a female product. So we came up with the first clinically proven FDA approved system for women's hair regrowth. And boom, home run. It's still and over a decade later, Karenique is still the category leader. And I don't own it, sold it off to private equity, but you'll find it in CVS, Rite Aid, Alta, Nordstrom's, and majority of the business is still direct response. So again, that is that is example. So I look for opportunities where the wind can be at my back and where there's a strong marketplace. And I do have some type of first mover advantage, but it's a proven marketplace. And I can see it's not a massive shift in doing that. Uh, we were fortunate when we launched Foundry. When I launched Foundry, it was I was looking for, to buy one and Foundry for context is an aggregator. It's a roll-up platform that buys Amazon e-commerce brand. When we were starting it, there were only five players in the marketplace and only one of that was well-funded as substance. That's when we got in. Therefore, when that first company got significant funding, the door opened up and they became the what I used to call Netscape uh, to the search engine market, basically creating and creating the door and the opportunity for Google. 
it created access to significant capital in the marketplace. So when I launched Foundry and I met with seven private equity firms for a startup idea, not a venture firm, we got six term sheets from seven meetings and was able to raise $100 million to launch the company. Everything and all the attention, all the opportunities were in our favor. And that's why I call a market shift that created an opportunity the wind was at our back. Um, so criteria is, is blue, uh, purple ocean opportunity where there's the economic factors that are giving you a strategic advantage where you are right now. And the other is that I find is that the more zeros you add on to the own idea, the easier it is to implement. And people are going to say, wait, how's that possible? Like this way, if I go out and say, hey, I have an idea, I'm going to create a reading glass company because I have a way that is more comfortable than any reading glasses in the marketplace. And guess what? We're going to scale this to a million dollars in revenue. The amount of people that I can recruit onto my team that will be excited about that to get to a million dollars, the amount of the amount of investors I can get, it's tough if I do that. When you say, here's my clear pathway and here's the clear plan to get to a billion dollars, the level of talent and the people you recruit, especially if it is that transformational movement that will impact lives, actually getting on the train for this and investors coming in and fundraising is a totally different level and is easier from that perspective. Again, I'm not saying being unrealistic, but it can be easier. So you say, what is my criteria is... Purple ocean opportunities, wind at our back from a timing perspective, um, big enough that I can add enough zeros on that when we have an outcome, this can impact a number of people's lives and give me resources to have even more impact. And, um, and again, ultimately, it's about it's about impact. So those are some of the criteria. Yeah. You know, Tom, when I look at your journey, I, I want to hear more about why. Ava, why agency ventures aggregator? Because like you said, you're a products person. If you look at, um, you know, what you did with um, Atlantic Brands, uh, what you did with Foundry, um, the, you know, if I were to predict, I would not have predicted Ava. So I don't know what you did in the field in Italy, but what, how'd you come to uh, <laughs> Ava? <laughs> <laughs> so it's you know it's a great question. So let me start with this: is that when I cut back, you have to look at yourself and do your own self assessment. When it comes down to it, is I'm a business architect. That's what I do. Is I build platforms that can scale. It is um, it's agnostic what business or what niche it is. I know how to do that. I know how to drive demand. I know how to create the team. I know how to create that passionate environment where people are fanatical in what they're doing. And how that works with systems and processes and structures and reporting to make complex as easy as possible. I get that from my industrial engineering background. Make complex, takes complexity and make it simple. So I know how to create those architectures. I know how to create the financial models as well as the operational models to make that happen and then bring in funding. And I can do that. What I found is that most when you start a business is most of the energy is put getting that. It's like a rocket ship. Get it. Most of the fuel is expended getting the rocket off the ground. Most of the um, uh, most of the resources are spent when you launch a company and getting it off the ground and getting some level. And most that's the risk is that first level is, is there traction? Is there a good customer base? Is it repeatable? What are the core metrics? Everything is perfect or horrible or basically unfounded when you have an idea for a business. So by buying an existing business, you take that same amount of energy is your ROI is going to be significantly more than that. Not only that, um, and so that's the foundation of why I like to buy businesses. But then if you can create an, a platform, which is what I learned at Foundry, to buy multiple businesses and put them into a platform where there's, a, I hate to use the word synergy, but where's that synergy and everything is aligned, you can have a bigger impact. The thing I one time I was hooked on is I only wanted to buy mid-size and large businesses because of the ROI and how it is, is um, um, the this, this staff and the infrastructure it has in place and the stability. The however on that is it is easier to double the EBITDA of a very small company than it is a very large company. And so how can you get the most? And from an acquisition perspective, and it's why I love acquisition, is you have the multiple arbitrage. 
There's less competition at companies with lower level of EBIT and profitability. There's large. So if you can buy companies at a three to five X and you can sell them for a six and a half to 10 X, again, you have that. And if you have the right infrastructure in place, you can double the EBIT on it. So again, there, I love the, that's why I love the aggregation play. But the question is, why agencies? You know, of all things, why agencies? Um, and then also what we solve for and why is, and you say, Tom, transformation and aggregator just sounds like it's a numbers and, and what financing arbitrage business you're in. So um, why agencies is I knew I wanted to do aggregation. I was looking at some great boring industries like uh, like HVAC. There's managed service providers, a lot of really good businesses out there that don't have a lot of sex appeal to them, but they're leaning easier from an aggregation play on how you can build a very large business from doing aggregation. On the other hand, um, two years ago when I was, um, two and a half years ago, I lived in Northern Bergen County, New Jersey, before we moved to Austin, Texas, I joined an online M&A group, met a gentleman who was rolling up, had a small agency and developed a programmatic M&A strategy to do roll-ups of, of advertising agency. And he acquired three over the past 30, uh, 90 days when I met him and had one a month for the next three months schedule. And I looked at his platform, what he did, and we just became friends. And I moved to Austin. We started biking and running with each other. And then when I sold Foundry during our bike rides, where it was, so I was supposed to be taking time off, it was, what is stopping you from implementing the strategy? And what I did at Foundry, why aren't you shooting for, it's an aggregation, it's a numbers play to get to a billion dollars. What are the challenges and what um, operating assumptions do you have to change in order to make that possible? And the question, uh, Jeremy, I always ask is, what has to be true to make that possible? And then if you can make those things true to make whatever outcome you're at possible, you have a new business and a way of looking at business. So in this case is, what has to be true for you to get to a billion dollars? And that was our conversation. And over time, it went from you to us. <laughs> what are we doing? And because um, he, in his pipeline at that point, he had her talk to, interview three agency owners that wanted to buy their business. So he had a significant pipeline and he was interviewing, again, his team was interviewing somewhere about three agencies a day that want to be purchased. So a proprietary pipeline was not an issue. Then there was the uh, question of is that we can do old school onboarding, basically uh, due diligence and integration. But how do you run? do that level of an, how do you buy one, two businesses a month? Because how do you get to a billion dollars? You buy a million and a half in EBITDA every month. You double the EBITDA over two years and then grow each of those agencies by 20% a year after that. Again, the math gets you to a billion dollars. However, and the big however is, is how do you solve that onboarding problem? Because this is a human focused business. And Peter Lang said, I have an answer for that. I've been talking with one of the leading digital strategists in the world, digital agency strategist, Felix Velarde out of London. And he figured this out. He developed after he built six agencies, successfully sold three over the years. He was the chairman of 14 different agencies. And then he um, and he also was the head of a roll up group. And then seven years ago, he decided at Burning Man to be able to create, put his methodology and work with agencies under $10 million. The first 32 agencies he worked with either doubled or tripled their profit within two years. So he said, hey, I have a good name for this program. We're going to call it 2Y3X. In two years, three extra business. And that was the name of the book he created. Uh, Shed is the publisher, and you can find it online if you want to buy it. It's a great book. And so, but his methodology is different. It's very people-centric. It says, um, Everything is about your succession team. So build your succession team is a methodology that he built. Basically, he builds a three-year roadmap with the succession team and not necessarily driven by the owner. And then after that, it's called the growth lab team. And then the growth lab team is trained over a two-year period of time on um, how to think strategically, how to run the business by the numbers. And they take over responsibility for the business because as we started from the very beginning, the reason why most businesses cap out at one, three, five, or, or 100 million is because it's something with the owner caps it out there. If you can unleash that with the team and create the vision and train them, you'll get to an unprecedented level of growth. So Peter said, we have that. What if we don't really integrate? We do line integration, take over accounting, finance, legal, and HR. 
we give them these consulting there and we buy agencies that are healthy, that are growing, that are passionate, that want to grow. And we create a financial structure that keeps them engaged in the business with a large return on investment. Therefore, we can ha- implement the two three x process. We'll bring a managing director over every three to five agencies that we acquire. And that person is there from a mentor and a guidance perspective. And we don't have to micromanage them. All we have to do is give them the resources and give them the guardrails and let the process do the uh, do it work. And that's the paradigm shift is it doesn't have to. Did you know, Jeremy, that um, 200 of the largest advertising agencies in the world are all roll-ups? And of those 200, when they do an acquisition, 80% of the time, the founders do not stay for their earn And when they leave, the succession team leaves. Now, because the agency doesn't have to pay the earn out and because the multiple arbitrage, financially, it's a win for them, even with losing some clients. But to me, this a destruction of enterprise value and a destruction of people value, or you can call it human capital. Yeah, it is. So if we have a better model to do acquisitions, and we're proving this in the agency space, but this new model for aggregation can be applied for any industry. And so we're developing this every 90 days. We uh, we run a program where we actually, people fly in throughout the company. We teach it because I can't, we can't have a big enough impact to the advertising industry or other service industries by us, by the 20 or 30 agencies we buy a year, the only way we can have impact is by teaching what we do and have other people implement that. Along okay. with our programmatic and mini process, which is really just uh, using Scrum and Agile methodologies. So I want to talk about an ideal company. Who, what does the ideal company look like uh, from an acquisition standpoint for you? Very good question. It's um, uh, minimum. so. There are exceptions, but the minimum bill is typically uh, $500,000. And we're looking for revenue between $1 million and $10 million. We're looking for agencies that um, have a full-time staff of over 10 people. We're looking for businesses that are healthy and that are growing and who values align with ours. Because, you know, values are something that's very important the way we're very people-centric. And so the organization has to be the same way. So if we look at minimum criteria, that's the minimum criteria. We're buying things that we're buying agencies across all different spectrum from we're buying everything from SEO, performance-based agencies, a lot of creative agencies, um, um, uh, agencies that focus on B2B, B2G, uh, B2C. It doesn't matter. We put like agencies into groups. Um, but we're buying across data. You know, we're looking at uh, right now. We are looking at some uh, data science and marketing analytics agency, a couple more tech agencies. So it could be really across the board from what type we are. And ultimately, we're putting agencies in like groups in which they have a common language and they could scale within the group. Walk me through, Tom, how you achieved and what you did with the first acquisition. Um, we bought a, it's an amazing agency out of, um, um, out of Atlanta, Georgia, and with a, with a really, um, uh, team that was, um, ready to move to the new level. And so the results, ha- the results are right now is based on the signed contracts they have in place. We acquired them just last June, the signed contracts that they have in place. Um, without getting any new businesses, they will increase their EBITDA by 60% next year. Six million high dollar agency doing highly profitable. And so that's really the foundation of it. And they're scaling by the existing clients doing more business with them and getting new more clients in. Um, what we did is um, the team is, uh, we measure success by the happiness of the team and the happiness of clients. And that by implementing this 2Y3X process has been extremely successful. Plus, they've turned to us and say, okay, can we use your resources and can you show it built to sales enabling a process? And so we did that. Can you help us win uh, more business and teach us how to give us the formats and the infrastructure for that? And that's what we've done. You know, we need some help in different technology. Great. So what do you need specifically? They ask us. Any agency we buy is they can choose to use our resources. They can use to, to do learn and do it on their own. They can choose to do use outside resources. We don't care. We just want to make it available. And if they want to compress time, we want to be there to help them do that. And so that is a ex, um, example of. And so since um, businesses are traded on multiple of EBITDA, primarily in the agency space, 
obviously we know what we did to the enterprise value and also at different thresholds, you also increase the multiple that you could be acquired for. What do you think from that first acquisition, what was a learning maybe that you're like, oh, we we have to make sure we do this again or that stuck out that, you know, maybe we can tweak this in the next one that we acquire and onboard? So um, you learn things with your business model. The initial business model we laid out there is we were going to do um, to be very efficient, we we're going to buy four to five agencies every quarter and have it done simultaneously and put and have form a group. Uh, the first lesson that we learned is that you want to be able to spend uh, focused time with each agency and therefore we're pacing it out to one to two agencies a month versus all simultaneously at the same time. It relieves a lot of pressure from your HR organization, your accounting, as well as the managing director. That's over there, as well as our two y 3 x consultants, we can pace things and stagger it. Um, you know, it's funny because it's really gone well. The team is on fire and I can't say we, oh shit, we did something um, other than our processes are a lot more efficient. Yeah. Where can people learn more? You said there are some trainings people can learn. I don't know if they're in person or or only in person or online. Uh, where should people go to learn more about that? Okay, so the... The easiest way to do that, if they email me at Tom at tshipley.com, I'll connect them with and let me know if you're interested in some of our trainings or our programs or interested in getting into our acquisition pipeline. Just email me. I'll connect you with the right person. Again, it's Tom at tshipley.com. Uh, we, uh, we have five people in our M&A team. We have a media company. Um, uh, Scallop Speed Media is the name of it. Scallop Speed, that all they're, they're doing is their whole purpose in life is to take the information and in our content and figure out ways to distribute it, to give it out and create programs. And one of the things they start doing is running events every 90 days in Austin. Love it. Next one coming up on, I think it's February 20th. And then oh, the I, one after it's May 3rd. I thank you. Yeah. That's, and um, I have one last question, Tom, first of all, thank you. And I want to encourage people to check out um, avaacquisitions.com to learn more about what they're doing. And my last question, Tom, is, you know, in we were talking before we hit record about economic downturns, and sometimes the greatest opportunities are in economic downturns. How do you think when you see this downturn, you know, some people are thinking scarcity and other things, and you think differently when there's an economic downturn? I, yeah, I think it's, a, I think an abundance is what opportunities are out there. And then how can I what structures can I put in place to take advantage of what's out there and minimize my risk at the same point? So um, right now, the one of the greatest opportunities is out there is in acquiring businesses. You have, you have I'm going to say, re, more realistic. My uh, um, And every the easiest you can say is, how am I going to grow my EBITDA by 10% or stay flat or go by 30%? You can increase your EBITDA by 30% by doing acquisition. If you do an acquisition, it doesn't mean that you need to have the cash to pay under for 100% of the business. There are a number of ways to fund that business. Quick story is when we started, uh, when we started Atlantico's Brands, we ran through everything we had to generate those first $338,000 of sales and had nothing left. We brought on a consulting client to pay a little bit of our bills and our overhead. We love their business in Hoboken, New Jersey. We made an offer to buy them for two and a half times EBITDA, even though we know that our business as a slight money loser that first year, we couldn't borrow the money based on it. And we didn't have the money to buy that business. We went out, met with three mezzanine lenders. Um, one loved it or two loved it. They gave us an offer. They gave us the money to buy that business. We bought 85% of that business. And two years later, they made more money from the 15% than they did the 85%. And that, that platform, which gave us products, Team infrastructure allowed us to grow from three hundred thirty-eight thousand to two and a half years later to one hundred twenty-five million dollars in revenue. And so again, it's thinking about it's thinking about things different. It's because of COVID that gave me time to think, and the change in the economic environment that created the opportunity to create foundry to go out and to uh, to start rolling up. And so, and the other thing in two thousand and eight, when the market had this massive downturn and things dried up. We said, do we fire half the staff and just hunker down or do we look for opportunities? And in that marketplace is we started calling media companies and saying, I know that the big brands are no longer buying media. 
let's negotiate rates and guaranteed on a cost per order basis so we have minimized our downside. We went big in the month of October. It was the most profitable month we've ever had. And then that's how we were able to scale between the infrastructure from the acquisition, a year later, having this economic downturn and us to be able to buy media so cheaply. And there wasn't a lot of competition out there, our, our scale. So there's always opportunities out there just taking a step back and looking around. And sometimes it's just one or two degrees to the right. The opportunities are out there and just sometimes just ask. I love it. Tom, thank you. Everyone check out avaacquisitions.com. Check out more episodes of inspiredinsider.com. And thanks, everyone. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Jeremy. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire. Came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. 